Hello and welcome, my name is Ryan, I'm also known as RM2K Dev. In the last video, we got the basics of our UI framework sorted so that we could log in. In this video, we'll be setting up our server-side data models. However, before we begin, I'd like to say a massive thank you for sticking around long enough to get to, I think this is episode uh, eight of the series. Um, and I do have a quick request and it would be a huge help to me if I could get you guys to go back to episode one and give it a like, um, if you haven't already, of course. Uh, basically, that's going to show the world who sees these tutorials in the search results that these episodes are worth viewing um, and are worth spending their time on. So if you haven't given episode one a like, I will place an annotation in the video right now. Um, please pause it and jump back to episode one and give it a quick like. Um, with that said, let's begin on episode eight, I think this is eight, nine or seven, one of the three. Um, <coughs> excuse me, I still have a bit of a um, man flu as we call it in Australia. It's when a man has a cold and it's absolutely devastating. Um, so yes, uh, logging in. So we have the we have the uh, UI side of things set up on our project. What we need to do now is jump back into our server side project and we're going to start creating some data models. Now, in order to get data models working, we're going to need to have a connection to our server, uh, sorry, our database. And so that means you're going to be needing to run your database on your local machine or if you're using a cloud provider like um, MongoLab, you can use that as well. Uh, I'm going to use a piece of software called RoboMongo. This is a piece of freeware, absolutely fantastic software for creating and maintaining databases of MongoDB. So the first thing I'm going to do is right click on my local host after I've connected. Actually, I'll show you. Actually, no, I can't because I have work stuff on there. Um, anyway, you, after you've connected to your local host machine, just right click on local host, select create database. And I'm going to call this RM2 MMO underscore test as that is what we named it in the connector string, I believe in our configuration file of our server. Under collections, we're going to create a new collection and we're going to call that users. And this is going to be the place that we store all of our user data inside of our application. Now that our database is set up, we can jump back to our server side um, and we're going to begin creating our database connection. So under our initializers folder, I'm going to create a new JavaScript file. This is going to be 01 underscore. I'm using numbers so that we can have the files load sequentially because they will come out of the file system in the order of the file names. So I'm going to call this one 01 underscore mongodb.js. Now in this file, we're going to use mongoose. So I'm going to say var mongoose equals require. And we're going to require in that mongoose library. And I think we defined mongoose inside of our packet.json in the first episode. Uh, mongoose, there it is. So as long as you've npm installed, that will exist under your node modules folder. And we should be able to require that into the application. Uh, this file is going to use module.exports. So hopefully by now you're familiar with how module.exports work and how require works as well. And I'm going to call this game db. Now, game db is going to be equal to the result of a function that we call on mongoose. So mongoose.create connection with a capital C. And the first parameter of that function is the database connector string. So that's going to be config.database. So I'll explain what happens here. We load the mongoose library and then we export a, um, a variable called game db, which is the result of a connection creation function inside of mongoose, which will be connecting to the database that we specified in our config section of our application. So um, from here, the next thing we need to do is create a model to represent our user. So I'm going to go into our models folder and I'm going to create a new JavaScript file and I'm going to name this file user.js. Now for user.js, we'll be using mongoose again. So I'm just going to say var mongoose equals require and we're going to require in that mongoose library. Now, the user schema that we're going to define is going to store our username, our password, the sprite of the player, the current room the player is in, and their positional data, so X and Y. So what we need to first define is a user schema. So I'm going to say var user schema equals new mongoose dot schema. And that takes a parameter, which is going to be the schema that we want to define. 
So I'm gonna say username is the first property that we want to define. And we want it to be a type of string. I'm gonna say type string. And I'll also want it to be unique. So I'm gonna say unique true. So basically the username is going to be our, um, it's gonna be our, uh, basically it's gonna be the ID of the user in the database. So no one else will be able to register the same username. We will still get an ID field, but I'm gonna use the username as the sort of unique key for this table. Then I'm gonna store the password. So I'm just gonna say password and that's just gonna be of type string. Now the difference between username and password is you can see here we have, um, I don't actually know what it's called in Mongoose, but I'd like to think of it as a rich data type declaration because we're declaring the data type as well as some additional parameters. Therefore it would be richer than just declaring the fact that the field is going to be a string like we do here in password. Uh, we also need to have a sprite I'm going to declare this as a string as well. Uh, we need the current room, so current underscore room, declare that as a string. We also need pos underscore x, which will be a number, and pos underscore y, which will also be a number. And that will do it for our um, user schema. Now, Mongoose gives us a couple of cool functions. Um, one of those is that we can actually attach uh, functions to the user schema so that the, I'll start that again. One of those is that we can actually attach functions to the user schema and call them before we have an instance of the user schema. They're called statics. So what I'm gonna say here is user schema, uh, sorry, I was just making sure I spelled schema right there. <laughs> um, user schema dot statics dot register. That's going to be equal to a function. And this function is gonna take a username, a password and a callback. Then I'm gonna create another one of these and we're gonna call this one login. And that's also going to take a username and a password and a callback as the uh, parameters for that function. Finally, we're going to export this into the global space of our application because it gets required in the start of our server. If you remember back to line, I think it was, let's have a look at this, line 20 inside of server.js, it is requiring in any files in the models folder. So we need to declare something that's going to exist on the global scope. And the way we do that is using another module.exports. I'm gonna say this one equals user and that's going to be equal to game DB. Now, if you remember, we we load the initializers first. So back in our server.js file, um, the first thing that happens is the initializers get loaded and then the models get loaded and then the maps get loaded. So we can safely assume that game DB exists and has been connected to the server. If the server wasn't available, sorry, the server as in the database server, if the database server wasn't available, the uh, connection will fail and your server application will crash or throw an error that you could handle later. So back in our user.js file, module.exports user equals gamedb.model because we're going to be using the user schema as our data model. I'm going to call this model user. That's the field name that it's going to map into our MongoDB and it will automatically put an S on the end because it knows that user is not plural. And the schema that we're going to use for that is the user schema. And that just about does it for our user schema. The only things that we have left to do are populate these two functions here, which we will do in just a second. Okay, so we're gonna do register first. The first thing we need to do is just define a new user. So I'll say var new underscore user equals new user with a capital U. It's going to be an instance of the module that we just exported at the bottom of the file. That will take a JSON um, object as its first parameter, which allows you to supply the data to this model. So we can say username is going to be equal to username. So the username that we supply to the model is going to be equal to the username that we pass into the function. We do the same for password. I think something's wrong with my tab ordering as well. Um, password is going to be equal to the password that we supplied in our uh, function declaration there. The sprite we will use is going to be spr underscore hero. The current room, this is where it gets a little bit interesting. So current room is going to be equal to the result of maps. Remember maps exist on the global scope so we can call it anywhere in our application. Config.starting zone. Config.starting zone. So now that's gonna give us access to whichever map is defined as our starting zone. And we're gonna say dot room. 
because that is the name of the room. Then we need to define our POS X and POS Y. And again, we can do this by saying maps config.startingzone so that we know which map we're dealing with dot start underscore X. And those, that was the starting position that we defined inside of the map. And we'll do the same for Y. So now we've declared a new user with all of the required data that it needs to be saved into the database. We can save that user into the database simply by typing new underscore user dot save. And this will actually call a function for us if we pass it in and supply us with an error code if there was an error saving that user into the database. So we can deal with that error simply by saying if not error. So basically if there was no error, then we'll just call our callback function, passing in true as the result. Otherwise, we can call our callback function, passing in false as the result. And that completes our registration function. Let's move on to the login functions. Login is very similar to register. However, it works in a backwards way. Rather than creating a new user, we're going to look up into the database and find if the user already exists. So we simply say user.find1. This is a method that Mongoose provides us. So take a look at the Mongoose documentation for more information on how that actually works. But the first parameter is going to be our database query. Now using MongoDB gives us the ability to search our database using JSON objects, which is a fantastic feature that you won't find in any other database engine uh, like SQL or MySQL. Uh, you will find this sort of feature in other database engines like Redis and other NoSQL uh, data providers, but we're using MongoDB here, so uh, I've gone off topic. Anyway, uh, user.find1 and the query is simply going to be that the username is equal to the username that we supplied in this function. So now that we have the query for our um, query, uh, the next function, sorry, the next parameter of this function is the optional callback. So we are going to use the callback by defining a new function, and that function will actually return us an error and the object that returned, so error or user. Now in this function, we can deal with the login. Um, we can actually say whether or not the username is correct based on the user. We can also throw an error if the user didn't come back from the database. So what I like to do first is I like to say if not error, so basically if there was no errors and user. And what that means is if there was no errors and the user object existed, because if this query failed to match an object from the database, then user would be null and error would be null. So there'd be no errors and the user wouldn't be there. So it wouldn't match this condition and it would jump out into our um, error or user doesn't exist method down the bottom here. However, if the user did exist, the first thing we want to do is compare if the password is the same as the password that was supplied to the login function. We can do that simply by saying if user.password so this is the user that was returned from the database is equal to the password that was supplied to the function. Then the callback will be uh, true and we'll pass the user object back from this function. If the password didn't match, the callback will be false and we will pass nothing back from the function. Now, if there was an error or the user didn't come back from the database, we will also pass in, sorry, we'll also use our callback and we will simply say, that it was false and no user comes back from this function. And that basically completes our login and register functions uh, for our user. So I'm just gonna run the application and make sure it still works, that we have no errors when the application loads. Our data model was loaded, which means that all of these functions were successfully initialized. And I think that will probably be it for this tutorial. So I hope you guys enjoyed this video. In the next video, we'll actually implement our login functions inside of GameMaker and we'll handle the login packet on the server side as well. So thank you guys for watching. Don't forget to like this video and share it with your friends, Facebook, Twitter, MySpace. Don't share it on MySpace. I'm just kidding when I say that, by the way. Um, but yeah, share it everywhere you can and like the video, subscribe to my YouTube channel and look out for the next video because it will be interesting. So thank you for watching. Bye guys.